I suppose if I have my work cut out for me, I have no one to blame but myself, because I'm the one who chose the scripture. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I, this is, I think, the, in the four weeks I've been here, this is the second uh, uh, scripture from Paul, and I think the last person who had to read one was also like, you got to be kidding me. The, again, the, wor- the way that Paul weaves words together is, I don't even know how we get it from Greek to English without, with any coherency. So, enough. You are enough. It's hard to hear sometimes, yes. I see it everywhere now, though. You are enough. I see it on t-shirts. I see it on bumper stickers. I see it on inspirational posters, coffee mugs, uh, daily monthly affirmation calendars, even billboards along the highway. You are enough. It's really wild to me that we collectively as a society have arrived at a place where we suffered so long for so many messages, from so many messages that we weren't enough, that we now have to be told daily that we are enough. Now, despite how sad that reality makes me, I'm glad there's a significant enough portion of our population that decided it was high time we start hearing that who we are, exactly as we are, is enough. Now sure, we can get into the debates about how believing in ourselves and believing we're enough does not excuse our rotten behavior. Knowing I am enough just as I am is not an excuse to take my just as I am-ness out on everyone else and not be held accountable for it or then get to turn around and say, well, I'm enough just as I am, so I'm really sorry about your feelings. (laughs) Herein lies the rub. We are enough. But in our imperfect humanness, we are also just short of enough. We are only always almost enough. I'm going to try and repeat that phrase several times today, and I will probably screw up the order of the words. It's enough for God, for sure, that we are only, always, almost enough. But still only almost enough. Almost enough. Now being almost enough is an admission of a sort of falling short, of not being quite enough. But in the space between our almostness, our humanness, and God's perfect love of which we fall short, is the peace where we can rest in the all-sufficient grace of God. Now, if you remember nothing else from this sermon, remember this. Even though we are only almost enough for whatever it is we feel the need to be everything for, and whether that's being enough of a friend in a friendship, enough of an employee at work, enough of a significant other in an intimate relationship, enough of a child to our parents, or enough of a parent to our child or children, or enough of a minister to our flocks. What will carry us through our almostness is realizing God loves us despite our almostness. In fact, that is the space in which God meets us. Our almostness is where we are met by God's all-sufficient grace and love. Now, I don't mean to feed a fed horse here, but this is why I chose the passage from Romans this morning. Hope. God's grace gives me hope. I have hope because I know of the reality of God's grace. To use a phrase from last week, I'm a prisoner of hope because prophetic voice is meant to be hopeful. I will keep professing and prophesying these theological truths I believe are deeply rooted in God's holy, living, breathing word because I'm a prisoner of hope to the idea that one day a critical mass of people will decide to heed both the warnings and the good news I and many others like me share and the world will turn in a covenant direction. Okay, because you know I have to, having heard me before, Here's the scholarly, exegetical part of my sermon where I sound like an apologist for Paul. 
I believe, however, that it is important to explain the true theme of Romans and Paul's message to his audience in Rome because it's not what it sounds like on the surface. The surface message of which is often what the church for centuries spread to anyone who would listen. I speak to a lot of people who are uncomfortable with Paul and his letters, and I can't blame them. One person I know referenced being a recovering Southern Baptist who never had much time to figure out what suffering had to do with hope. We have, through God's grace, in the gift of Jesus Christ. And I can't say I disagree. It is Paul's theology and instruction based thereon that is so often taken out of context and absent good exegesis is used to cause division, hurt, exclusion, and even trauma to many within and outside of the church by the church. Now please note I'm using the word church here with a big C. I'm not talking about your church. I'm talking about the church. As a side note, if you want a great take from a young scholar in his own right, please read Paul the Progressive, The Compassionate Christian's Guide to Reclaiming the Apostle as an Ally. It's a book by my friend Eric Smith. It's a shameless plug for his book. I have no vested interest in this. I mean, he's not giving me a kickback. I did, by the way, also notice this morning that on the back of that book, uh, it is endorsed by your general minister and president. So, you know, there's that. Another shameless plug, Eric's wife, Jessa, is a very, very, very talented artist and uh, potter. And if you are looking for, you know, like a gift, like a chalice and patent or a fountain for your backyard, she's awesome. Look her up. Another shameless plug. You're welcome, Jessa. Anyways, back to Paul and Romans. Again, Paul's theology and instructions to early communities based on that theology is itself often hard to read, even without the church using it as a means to exclude people. It's important to point out, however, that in addition to my friend Eric, people like Nicholas Thomas Wright, more well known to us as N.T. Wright, had a different take. Not unlike Paul himself, N.T. Wright can certainly come off as a little paternalistic and condescending when he says things like, Having studied Romans intensively for much of my adult life, I, of course, believe that my current opinion on its historical and theological meaning, though humble, are accurate. <laughs> wow. I'm, like, surprised he even managed to fit the word humble into that sentence. <laughs> now, despite my own whiteness and maleness, as well as that of Eric Smith's and N.T. Wright's, I can at least appreciate that for Eric and myself, I'm not going to speak for N.T. Wright, we're all allies of all of God's children. And as for N.T. Wright, I'm happy to say that his scholarly exegetical work provides an interpretive space for allies to share Paul's word in a hopefully inclusive and helpful light. Another side note, it's not lost on me that as a white male against whom a misinterpretation of Paul's theology is not often weaponized, it's easier for me to feel comfortable reading, interpreting, and preaching on Paul's messages. Now, to be clear, scholars' attempts to expose Paul's more progressive and or softer side can often seem like mental gymnastics. I've got plenty of questions for my friend Eric Smith after having read his book. The reason for this, however, is not simply an attempt to save Paul from more conservative atonement theory, justification-based theology that weaponizes him, though there is that. But the real reason it can seem so confusing to read exegesis of Paul through scholarly and academic lenses is because Paul was a very intelligent and passionate person, likely dictating his theology to a scribe at a rate of a million words a minute. No way that scribe was keeping up with everything. His works are heady and therefore confusing, even to those of us who have spent, like N.T. Wright, our entire adult lives studying the text. It's crucial to do this work, though, so that superficial, surface-deep interpretation does not result in the church believing that it is justified through its faith in Jesus and therefore excused from all of its damaging anti-covenant behavior. As you've heard me say before, when Paul says we are justified through faith in Jesus Christ, he means Christ's and God's faith in us, not the other way around. Now, having said all that, it is N.T. Wright who reminds us that in Romans, Paul's theological opus, if you will, 
Paul is driving home our justification by faith through a central message of God's ultimate righteousness or justice. Not through our being cloaked in God's righteousness, mind you. Wright points out that for centuries, and even still today, Paul's message of justification and God's righteousness is misinterpreted and misconstrued by too many in the church to be the doctrine of atonement, atoning faithful believers who are now blessed with God's righteousness through their faith. This is incorrect. And as stated a moment ago, it is the basis for much of the church's damaging behavior, excused through its own self-righteousness, as opposed to God's righteousness. In the words of N.T. Wright, Romans has been thought of for centuries as the letter in which Paul expounds his doctrine of justification by faith. This tr half-truth has opened up some aspects of the letter and concealed others. As will become clear, the theological content of this substantial opening section contains justification by faith within it by implication. But this is not the stated theme of the letter. The theme is the revelation of God's righteousness. God's covenant faithfulness, God's justice in and through the gospel proclaimed of the crucified and risen Messiah. This letter has announced itself as a treatment not so much of humans, their plight and their rescue, but of God, God's gospel, God's righteousness. End quote. This is not a message of the doctrine of atonement whereupon the faithful suddenly are justified, i.e. we are cloaked with or somehow take on the righteousness of God. Atonement is not what Paul means when he says we're justified by our faith. This is not just incorrect theology, contextually and culturally, it is dangerous. It is dangerous because this doctrine of atonement and justification are what have led the church for centuries to excuse and justify their covenant-breaking behavior. Hate, exclusion, fear, othering, greed, and narratives of scarcity over and above God's covenant narrative of love and abundance. The backdrop to our scripture this morning is the overarching theme of Romans. For Paul, the gospel itself, the good news, revealed God's righteousness, surely. But for Paul, it was also literally just the announcement of the good news that revealed God's righteousness and put the world on notice that God did indeed fulfill the covenant promise through Jesus and that salvation from all the garbage and hardship of life was finally realized. Anyone know who Nadia Bolz Weber is? Yeah. I won't bore you with a biography, but I've been present in the room with her when she has talked about how wrong Christianity gets it when we talk about God exchanging violence for violence. Atonement. God, like some father mob boss with a cigar hanging out of his mouth, making a sacrifice in exchange for something else. Jesus did not die to atone for our sins. God did not murder God's beloved child to take the place of our mistakes. This would be violence for violence. That is not my God. It doesn't even make sense to me. It never has. What Nadia says is this. Some would say that instead of the cross being about Jesus standing in for us to take the really bad spanking from God for our own naughtiness, what happens at the cross is a blessed exchange. God gathers up all our sin, all our broken junk. That's not her word, but I'll use junk because it's prettier for church. Takes all our broken junk into God's own self and transforms all that death into life. Jesus takes our crap and exchanges it for his blessedness. Adam Erickson offers this interpretation of Nadia's words. Nadia describes perfectly what the nonviolent atonement is all about. God doesn't respond to human sin and violence with God's own violence. God didn't kill Jesus on the cross. Humans did. The atonement is about God in Christ absorbing human violence and exchanging it with God's love. On the cross, we discover that God would rather die from our violence. Hear that again. On the cross, we discover that God would rather die from our violence than inflict violent death upon anyone else. 
In other words, Jesus died for our sins in order to transform our understanding of God. God has nothing to do with violence, but everything to do with transforming all that death into life. Now back to N.T. Wright and Romans for just a second. According to N.T. Wright, the gospel message about Jesus opens people's eyes to see for the first time that this was what God had been up to all along. It enables Jews to see how the promises they had cherished had been fulfilled, quite otherwise than they had expected, of course. It enables Gentiles to see that there is one true God, the God of Israel, the creator, that this God has purposed to set the world to rights at last, and that this God has now, in principle, accomplished that purpose. God did what God said God would do. And we collectively, collectively, the Jews and the Gentiles, all the world, all God's children, all humankind, were and are the beneficiaries. This is our justification through or by faith. God's faith in us and in the covenant, Jesus' faith in God, and our faith in both of those. This is the justice and righteousness of God at work. And we are justified and saved from the empires of the world through God's justice. We are not justified in the forgiveness of our sins, the washing clean of our mistakes and failures, the redemption through Christ's sacrifice for our shortcomings and covenant violations as atonement theorists within the church would have us believe. Justification means something different. We are justified through God's faith in us, Christ's faith in God, and our faith in both of those through God's righteousness and justice, through God's faithful fulfillment of the covenant by setting the world right through Jesus. And get your head wrapped around those mental gymnastics. In other words, we're justified because God fulfilled the covenant by bringing justice to the world through the life teachings and unfortunate violent demise of Jesus. All of that to get to the beginning of the scripture, to get through the beginning of the scripture for this morning. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we now stand. Now hopefully I'll wrap up real quick so <laughs> now that we know what justification means. Now first, Take a deep breath. There we go. Think about how knowing that through Jesus, God ushered God's righteous justice into the world. And think about how through knowing that, that brings us peace with God and can help us understand God's all-sufficient grace. Think about the peace we feel knowing that God's actions already ushered in God's justice and how we, in all our falling short, in all our almostness, are always met with God's all-sufficient grace. Smile and take another deep breath. No, really, do it. In an attempt to get full circle here, I'll go back and tell you that I chose this scripture this morning again because of hope. After all, I am... A prisoner of hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Certainly I could have talked about hardship and suffering and how they eventually lead to hope. It's a message I discuss with sailors and counseling regularly. Does God cause bad things to happen to people? It's the old theodicy question. It's, it is dangerous to say God causes suffering to make us stronger and eventually leave us with hope. Instead, we can simply say that life is full of complications and difficult times from which we learn and grow. But with God's all-sufficient grace and love, we come out on the other side stronger, more resilient people. I mean, who can honestly say that despite the lingering hangover and exhaustion we continue to feel from COVID, that we cannot find ways to learn from it or how to be stronger and more resilient? Can anyone here honestly say they learned nothing from those two years and on? We all learned something, even if it was that almost every meeting can be an email. <laughs> In terms of almost enough, I could have talked about how we often feel ourselves not enough, not worthy of God's love, not worthy of God's grace in which we stand. Not enough for the peace we can feel at knowing we are justified through God's fulfillment of the covenant through Jesus. Or not worthy of the overwhelming love of God being poured into our hearts. 
We simply are not enough. We are only always almost enough for peace, for a grace, for a love that great. We simply often feel unworthy. We are only always almost ready for whatever chapter is next in our lives. We are only always almost enough, almost pretty enough, almost smart enough, almost skinny enough, almost fast enough, almost successful enough. Here is what I know about being only always almost enough. Hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and good things never die. Hope for me is so tied to God's grace that it's nearly impossible for me to differentiate between the two. Hope for me is rooted in God's all-sufficient grace. The gap between our almostness and our completing God's covenant justice work is where we do indeed meet God's all-sufficient grace. And if I didn't believe that God's grace was there for me, my life would feel pretty hopeless. I still believe deeply, hope deeply, that with God's grace, all humankind will fulfill God's covenant by ushering the kingdom, the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And I leave you with what, we, what were originally the words of Rodgers and Hammerstein from their 1954 musical Carousel from the song, You'll Never Walk Alone. Some of you may be more familiar with the versions recorded by Jerry and the Pacemakers, Elvis, Roy Orbison, or most recently Marcus Mumford of Mumford and Sons. But I digress. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain. For your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. Through God's faith in us, God's faithful fulfillment of the covenant, Jesus' faith in God, and our faith in all of that, we are justified and saved from the greed and division and hate of the empires of the world by God's justice and God's righteousness. You are enough. Your almostness is enough. Your only always almost enough is enough. Though, me, though we may only be always almost enough to accept it and receive it, God's grace will fill the gaps for us and give us the strength to carry on. For with hope in our hearts, we will never walk alone. Amen. <laughs>